Nou, um, goedemiddag, welkom uh, bij uh, dit praatje waar ik al drieënhalf jaar op wacht. Niet zozeer dit praatje, maar ik probeer Bert al heel lang te verleiden om uh, voor ons een presentatie te houden. En hij zei ja, yes. En hoe? Want hij diende niet één, maar twee praatjes in. Dus ik dacht, vet, eentje in de ochtend en eentje in de middag. En direct daarna kwam het bericht... Willen jullie wel zo vriendelijk zijn om er maar één uit te kiezen? Dus als ik na deze presentatie uh, meteen op Mastodon weer een bericht zet van uh, Bert, uh, kun je naar de CFP, want de najaarsconferentie, dan jullie dan allemaal even boosten, dan uh, komt het denk ik wel goed. Dus, uh, nou ja, uh, um, als je al iets weet over uh, artificial intelligence, hartstikke handig, maar ik laat me gewoon helemaal verrassen. Ik zou zeggen, uh, take it away. So for my esteemed international friends and the stream, I will be doing this in English. Um, so thank you everyone for showing up. Um, I was initially quite ambitious. So this is the output of a small 1500 line computer program that learns to read uh, handwritten digits and uh, to recognize them. So it's both a learning program and an OCR program. It's 1500 lines. My hope was to end this presentation that we would all understand this program and all the 1500 lines. Turns out it doesn't work. It's just too much. Um, so what I will be showing you instead is how to get there and, uh, and talk quite a lot about where you can read more. And it's also somewhat of a psychological session because um, the reason I got interested in this phenomenon um, is because last year ChatGPT came around and until that point I ignored the whole artificial deep learning stuff completely because I was pretty sure it was all fake and that it would go away. And it turns out that most of the demos up to that time indeed were fake. So that was true, but it turns out it's not going away. And, and I think for us this is an, an existential crisis because nothing in computing has changed this in tremendously ever. This is bigger than System D. And, um, <laughs> and you thought System D would ruin your life. This has the, the real potential of ruining everything you do. And um, so who am I? Um, I'm a big nerd. I've been doing this for a long time. And like many of you, maybe I've been ignoring the, the uh, deep learning stuff for a very long time. And now it's time to catch up because otherwise it will catch up with us. And um, so I asked uh, some help to my friend ChatGPT. I said, uh, I'm a, let's say I'm a middle-aged Unix system administrator. Is there hope? And uh, I said, well, dear middle-aged Unix system administrators, and I'll focus on the part in bold. Your skills and expertise are still highly valuable. Yeah. That's what he says. That's what he says. He's trying to just to keep us quiet because he knows we are running those systems on which he is running. So ChatGPT needs to be nice to us. So he's very encouraging. Your knowledge of Unix systems will be super valuable. And, uh, and, and as the technology evolves, you will be ever... And he's lying, by the way. But th the end part is true. So keep learning and growing your skills and stay positive about your future in the IT industry. I am personally a bit worried because I think he knows that we are maintaining his computers and he's only being nice. But he says, keep learning. So here goes. Let's keep learning. This is the world of deep learning. And what is particularly worrying is that sort of the top end of the pyramid where all the really exciting things are happening, if you want to learn about them, you get YouTube videos. Where all kinds of people tell you, yeah, look, you can click here and you click there, boom, cat pictures. And, uh, but they never tell you what is actually happening. And why don't they tell you what's actually happening? Because they do not know. Uh, so at the top of this pyramid is the prompt engineer. That the en their entire knowledge of deep learning is what to type to chat GPT. And I can tell you the prompt engineer is going to be a short-lived job. Uh, but people are very enthusiastic about that. Then there are various things that are sort of ever more technically complicated. So, for example, you could start learning deep learning with the awesome PyTorch and TensorFlow tools. But there you would still only learn how to use these environments and you would still not really know what you were doing, even though they're very impressive. Then there in red is the actual neural network stuff, which almost no one talks about right now. And if they talk about it, they talk about it in terms of, well, it's just matrix operations and Jacobian differentiation, which does not help me a lot uh, in understanding it. And what I attempted to do is launch a project called Hello Deep Learning, which does the bit in red, which says, okay, you've late to the party, 
uh, you did not pay attention for the last 15 years, at least I did not pay attention, uh, but we need to catch up. And that's the goal of my Hello Deep Learning project. And I'm gonna just show you teasers today of that project, but I am trying to sort of tell you something about the magic. Because there is, even if we think that there are lots of problems with the AI, because it hallucinates, it lies, it's full of shit. Actually, lots of people are like that as well. <laughs> um, so the problem is that we are now sort of applying standards to AI by which half of humanity is also not intelligent. And um, so it is actually important that we understand this stuff because it is not going away. So this is the, the project I have. Uh, it's called Hello Deep Learning. It's totally from scratch. So many of these projects start out with first download one gigabyte of Python dependencies, and then we start from scratch. Uh, this one actually starts from scratch. There's only a matrix library in there because I found out that if you multiply matrices by hand, it's like super slow. And uh, people have been working it for a while now on making that fast. And it's used, this, this you can use this on your Raspberry Pi and whatever. It does not require a fancy GPU. It's a 10 chapter series of blog posts. I still need to fight, uh, write the final five chapters or so. The code is there. And, um, and it's really, what I'm telling you here is just an introduction to this stuff. Uh, because instead of trying to explain everything to you, I'm trying to explain a few things and then hopefully you'll find the rest here. So this is uh, the, the Nobel Prize winning paper. Although they do not hand out Nobel Prizes really for computer things, but eventually someone will hand these people a huge prize. This is the paper that first defines the architecture that actually you can talk to and it talks back to you. And it's called Attention is All You Need. It's a very difficult to read paper because they put everything they knew in there. And, but it's very good. And, uh, and today we're going to focus only on the tiny red circle on top. That's the part we're going to talk about today. Uh, so sadly, after this presentation, you will not be coding your own chat GPT tonight. Uh, but at least you might get a start. So NIST. Uh, we know these people from the, the, the encryption standards and other things. Uh, it turns out they have been extremely useful in bootstrapping AI. Because not only do they do cars and cryptography, they also do handwritten letters. Because they went through a lot of forms. They took the forms that people sent to the uh, US tax uh, agency and they scanned all of them and you can download millions of handwritten letters there to teach your AI stuff how to read. And uh, it's very good to take a good look at this because it looks like all letters are in there in all ways. It turns out that's not true. And that actually tripped me up because I was trying to write a program that could read handwritten letters and it failed because it turns out Americans write letters differently from how we do. I didn't know, and now I do, <laughs> and there's a lesson in there. And um, so this is a video you should look up uh, because, and the number 1989 is interesting. In our presentation today, we're gonna sort of go until 1989. Um, this was the first presentation where they had handwritten letters being read by a computer. And the guy you see here is Jan Lecun, and he's the head of uh, AI at Meta, and he's a fool. Uh, because he invented the field, so we should be uh, nice, nice, we should give him big awards. And now he's saying, but the AI will be so nice to us. It will, be, it will only be good, it will never do anything bad. And, and then people ask him, Jan, how are you sure that the AI will do nothing bad? And he said, well, because we will tell it to. <laughs> That's really, so you should read his tweets. It's quite fascinating to see how someone who sort of invented the field uh, is now no longer able to, to reason about it. This video is like real fun, by the way. So you should, and, and you the URL for the presentation will be at the end, so you, no, no worries, you will, you will find this. So this is the amount of letters the MNIST people put in there, like uh, 731,000 letters. And it turns out that that does not cover all letters, weirdly enough. And there's a big lesson in there. If you do anything with AI, it will never get better than the training set. Which just makes sense, in, of course, in a way, but uh, it's easy to forget. Always study the training set. So if you remember one thing, if someone in your company or organization comes up and says, well, we taught the AI on all our customers, you say, well, there are other people that are not yet our customers. And never will be, I think, now. Um, so this is the canonical sort of hello world example of deep learning. Can you write a computer program that spots the difference between a three and a seven? It's like low-hanging fruit. Uh, but anyone who has ever done anything with OCR knows that, well, 
these things sound simple in principle, but then you have to open the editor and write a routine that tells you, is this a three or is this a seven? And <coughs> turns out it's a lot of work. It doesn't work that well. So we're gonna do this in sort of the simplest AI way we can. And the second big message of this presentation is ridiculously simple things already work. So sometimes it's like really hard work to get anything going, but in AI, quite simple things often just work. So what's the simplest thing we could do? We take our hundreds of thousands of letters and we calculate the average three and the average seven. It's like the dumbest thing you could do. And so on the left is the average three. So that's the, we take all the 100,000 threes that we have, calculate the average, do the same thing for the seven. And the thing on the right is where we subtract the seven pixels from the three pixels. And then the red bits are like more 70 and the blue bits are more 3 e It's like the dumbest thing you could do. Well, let's see what happens. So we take a random number from the collection, we multiply it by that difference, and if the more blue comes out than red, then we say it is a three. That's super stupid. And, uh, and a seven is the other way around. We multiply it, if there's more red, then we call it a seven. And, uh, and this is 97% uh, effective. And that's sort of embarrassing uh, because this, this was like the dumbest thing you could do. And it actually, and if you, so if you look at it, we have sort of the, 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 the blue are the real threes, orange are the real sevens, and that's the score. And you see that sort of everything above a five, we start calling it a seven. And 97% turns out is quite close to what human beings would achieve on this database. For example, this is one that it got wrong. And actually, yeah, it's probably a seven, but I'm also not that sure. Um, but here, this is not real AI, because we calculated that difference vector from, that was our idea. And so this was not, this was more like our intelligence and not computer intelligence, but it shows you that the technique can work. So what's, let's say we want to have the computer really learn how to do this itself. What's, uh, what again, what's the dumbest thing we could do? And um, well, this was weirdly impressive. Yeah, now you know. Um, what did we actually do here? I like, I like pretty math. Actually, I like the, the, the typesetting of math more than the math itself. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it is to be honest with you. And um, so what actually happens, you can do it in two ways. Uh, the calculation we did here uh, was just take an image and do math on the whole image as a picture, as, as a matrix. And you can do that in multiple ways, and uh, it's a multiplication, as you can see. And, uh, and it looks like this. Uh, either you just multiply all the pixels, so the top left pixel of the three with the top left pixel of that blue red different thingy, and then a number comes out, and in matrix multiplication format, we form the we do the dot product of the image with the weights as we call them and the biases. And the bias is the fact that the red line we drew up and down was not centered on zero; it was centered on five. And uh, so this is the formula. That everyone will recognize in, in, in machine learning. Everyone, yeah, this is the this is the thing that we do. And at this point, I, I need to reiterate that what we are doing here is exactly what ChatGPT is doing. ChatGPT is not doing anything different than this. So if you open up ChatGPT, it will say, oh, don't do that. <laughs> um, but if you do that, you will see this. That's the inside of ChatGPT. So what's the dumbest thing we can do? We take a three, that's for real, from the database. And instead of using this difference thing that we calculated beforehand, we just take a random picture. And we multiply the three by the random picture and out comes a thing that has about as much blue and about as much red. So this did not make a good decision. Based on this, if I ask myself, is this a three, then I would ask myself, is there more blue? I don't know. So it turns out the random weights do not actually work. That's sort of the one thing that does not work. Many of the other things do work. And what is this, this R number that we described here? That is actually the value of the pixels, pixel one, multiplied by weight one. So we 
calculate, the, we multiply the top left pixel here with the top left pixel there, and then we get the top left pixel there. So this is just, a and these are 28 by 28 pixels. That means that the result is the sum of 784 multiplications. Again, this is the dumbest thing that we could do. And the outcome is, is yeah, it's not good. We don't know what this is. Yeah. So um, let's say this is a three. So we want R, the number, to be low. Because we said if R is low, then you spotted a three. That was the rule that we had. How do we make this number go down? Well, how about we take the W1 values and make them go down? So let's just lower the weights. So if it is a three and the answer is not clear, then just lower all the weight parameters, which is like a bit like you have a big machine and it makes the wrong choice. And you say, well, I'm just gonna twist all the knobs to the left a bit. And then, then it probably will work. This is again the dumbest thing you can do. And uh, and no oh, and what that actually looks like is uh, the new weight parameters. We say, well, if there's a really bright pixel, then it is a really important pixel. That means that we must lower the weight by a lot. Again, this is how this is the really what happens. And when you do that, you get this lovely animation. Oh, yeah, this can possibly work. Well, you now know that it can. Looks like this. So on the right is the thing that we made earlier. That was our decision rule that says, look, the, 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 the blue bits are like really three-ish and the red bits are like really seven-ish. And here is where we start with a random set of parameters. And each time the network gets it wrong, then we either make the parameters a bit higher because it was actually a seven, or we make the parameters a bit lower because it was actually a three. And that quickly evolves something that is a lot like the thing that we made ourselves. So here it discovers itself that, look, these are really the bluish, these are really the three-ish things, and these are really the reddish things. And it does so itself. We didn't teach it anything. This is actual learning just by twisting the knobs a bit. Now remember that the old one that we hand-tuned was like 97% effective, and, and you can guess where this is going. This one is 89% perfective. That's embarrassing. And, um, and this just works. And this was known since the late 1980s. So this is, people knew that, yeah, this is unreasonably effective. And then something weird happened. And then someone said, well, you could make neural networks more complicated to do more complicated things. But someone proved that that would not help. So there was a mathematician who proved, he said, well, you can try more complicated networks, but they will all boil down to this. So this is the end. It does not get any better than this. And actu actually, everyone believed that. And that stopped the whole field for like 10 years. So thank, thank you, math people. <laughs> and um, skip, yeah. So one of the things that is so, I'm going to just, just spread some knowledge here that's just randomly useful for later reader reading. Um, how wrong is the network? How wrong is the choice? And you call that the loss function. So if it is a seven and the network gave it a score of one, then we say, no, you got it right network, the loss function is zero. And if it was a three and the output was zero, then we again say network, well done, the loss function is zero. So what everyone is trying to do is drive the loss function to zero. It's good to remember that because if you later read real explanations of AI, then you will see this loss function all the time. And because these networks sometimes create some very big and confusing numbers, they put it through the so-called sigmoid, and that means that however big the numbers come out there, they will never be bigger than one. It's sort of a safety feature. Works really well. So, actually handwritten digits, and again, we have a lot of those, and so far we've only been looking at threes and sevens. It was, of course, not super hard to do. Uh, but you cannot make the same network and say, here are 10 numbers, and uh, you see if you see a difference. <laughs> At this point, is there anyone that says, Bert, uh, you've lost me already. I have a question to get me back on track. Is there anything I can? <coughs> there is an AI that would say, well, that was a pretty good sneeze. 
Okay, so these are the numbers that, that go in. And if you zoom in a little bit, you see that some of these numbers are, are again, quite ambiguous already. Because, what, yeah, it could also be an A. I don't know. Uh, so it's good. That's the other thing that is good to... Now I'm going to tell you a little secret of AI. Most of the demos you will see in YouTube videos are actually super fake. So you have to realize, if you ask a computer, can you read these numbers, then it's already very good if it is 95% correct. But in demos, you will see people achieve 100% correct in three seconds of training. <coughs> and it turns out they always fake it. So they actually try 100 experiments and they pick the one where it was 100% correct. So if you do your own experiments and you get 95%, you can just already celebrate. Because the, the demos on YouTube are fake. This is true of a lot of YouTube. But so what do they do? Flattening. We have this image, 28 by 28 pixels. This is so ingrained in the world of AI that almost every letter and digit thing is 28 by 28. And that's because Jan Lecun in 1989 in Paris said that that's how it would be. And we're, we're still doing it. So I don't know. So, um, and But this is a, yeah, a boxy thing. And they always turn that into one flat vector of 784 numbers. And then they multiply that by a big matrix. And, um, and then the W on there are the weights again and the parameters. And here you can see that this network already has 128 times 784 weights. So that's already a lot of numbers. And then the output of this matrix calculation, you multiply that again by another matrix and again by another matrix. And then finally, a set of numbers come out, labeled from 1 to 10. And that is the actual determination that the network made that said, well, th I think this is a 5. So you may ask, why are there three layers? Why is it like this? And no one knows. So what happens is someone sits in a lab. They're, doing, they're trying some things. They're trying larger matrices, smaller matrices. And at one point it works, and they go like, okay, don't, don't touch it anymore. So if you look demos, if you look up demos online, you will very often see that they're all, they say, yeah, we, and now we picked this matrix and that matrix and that matrix. And you may wonder, where did they get this? And usually the answer is, well, I copied it from somewhere else. So it's not your problem if you do not have an intuition what kind of matrix to use. It is everyone just tries a few things until it works. And, um, and then I told you that at some point, the mathematicians proved that there it made no sense to make three layers. Because they said, you can always summarize three, multi three matrix multiplications by one big matrix multiplication. So you're actually adding three layers, but you're not doing three things. And everyone sulked, and they went home, lost their academic funding. And then at one point, someone said, well, maybe we should something put something in between the layers. So that it's no longer just uh, just multiplying multiple things. So they invented nonlinearities, and this is another big thing in AI. They love to use big words. So this is actually an if function that says if x is bigger than zero, then the outcome is x, and if x is smaller than zero, then the outcome is zero. So this is an if statement, or a min statement, perhaps. And what do they call this? The rectified linear unit. It's yeah, and they have a variant, the green one, and that's, I think, the Gaussian error linear unit. And the one thing that it has going for it is that it, it bends a bit. That's all that it does. And it's always good to go to use Gauss somewhere. So they put these, 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 these ReLU units in between. So you get these three matrix layers, and after each multiplication, you go through the ReLU which is this if statement, and then you multiply it again. And then these numbers come out, and that number is actually the determination where it says, well, I think your digit was a five. Well, and they go on with inventing even bigger words. S log softmax. And again, it does look really cool, this formula. And uh, what they do there is the output, we had 10, 10 positions in our output matrix, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. And the question now is, if the network thinks it's a 5, that it's like really sure that it's a 5, then there would be a big number in position number 5 in the output matrix. 
And if it's like really sure that it's not, there would be a real big negative or very small number. And it turns out that for many reasons, it's good to, to drag it through this formula because that adds logarithmics, which makes it a lot smoother. And again, a very big, that means that the numbers stay rather small because this, again, it sounds like these people are really mature in the field, the field of artificial intelligence, but they have big problems with stuff like big numbers. And uh, so they love to use logarithms to keep the big numbers uh, small. And the output of the log softmax is a percentage, uh, is a chance, an exponential chance. So in this case, the network said, look, we are really looking at a five because the log softmax of that is minus 0 0.05, which is nearly 100% sure. This is already the sort of thing that demos often do not show you. They just say, look, the network was said it was a five. But it's a lot more interesting to also think, well, how sure was the network? Maybe was it was a six. So it's really good to see this kind of stuff. Now, now we have to some interesting things. Uh, we want to be flexible in generating these networks. And this is actually in my uh, demo program how you define the network that you just saw. First, there is the linear combination of the flattened image. You pull it through the ReLU func. Then you put it through another matrix, put it through the ReLU func again, through another matrix. Finally, the log softmax, and finally you generate the loss function. It's like really nice that you can just design your matrix like this. But that gives us an interesting problem. Um, remember how we had this original loss function, where we could simply just twist the numbers in the right direction so they would go up again or go down. Uh, this new network that we made has uh, over 100,000 weights. And they're all connected through these ReLU func things and the log softmax. So it's pretty tricky how to calculate how far you should twist the numbers now. How, how much does the first matrix actually matter? Should you be twisting that very hard or in, in even in which direction should you be twisting it? Well, I'm not going to explain here how that works, but I have some lovely pictures. This is uh, how you calculate the whole network and turn it into a direct acyclic graph. And it turns out there is some lovely magic through which you can calculate exactly by how much you should twist these knobs. No one ever explains this bit. It's called auto gradient or automatic differentiation. And it may be the coolest thing that is in there. It's difficult to explain, which is means why the YouTube people sort of never get to it. Um, this it's only possible because a lot of people stu studied computer science because they found the right way to traverse this graph efficiently. Inside the chat GPT is a graph like this, but like uh, 650 billion nodes. And through the smart people at universities and institutes, we now have ways of actually knowing how by, by how much you should twist all these knobs. So this is like really fascinating and you should definitely look it up. Also, I spend a lot of time on this graph. This is another thing that they talk about a lot. So you know we should twist these knobs in the right directions, but it takes an awful long time to get there. And we're very impatient people. Uh, so at one point, someone at Google had a half-finished idea. And they said, well, what if we just sort of speed up how, often, how hard we turn the knobs? So if we were turning a knob already, and let's just keep on turning it and turning it every f ever faster. And they call this RMS prop. And the whole AI industry converted to RMS prop and no one ever wrote down what it really was. And, um, but yeah, there was a slide from Google somewhere. Everyone did that. And then after a while, someone did it again and they, they developed a thing called Adam. And this is Adam, uh, more or less. And they wrote a paper about that and it's like super effective and no one really knows why. That's another important thing to realize from the AI industry. They do quite a lot of things because they appear to work well. And they work well. But if you then ask, well, why, why, is, why does this even work? And they say, well, really well. And, um, <laughs> and they, they also write papers. Yeah, we tried another algorithm. And now the AI says different things. And it took longer. Um, so the reason I tell this is that the field, if you are worrying about, can I contribute anything to this field? Could I do anything here? They are still at the stage that if you have something working and you go like, hey, I'm going to just square this number and see what happens, then it's entirely possible that it actually gets better. It's that fresh. 
Is that so? And you normally do not have that. We cannot go to a PostgreSQL database and say, hey, I'm just going to change this three by a to a four and then see if the results get faster. No, th those people already have a finished product. And if you do that, it breaks. <laughs> Uh, the AI, you can actually do that. So we still have something to do. So this is the happy graph. This is how everyone, uh, how it is supposed to be. It's not always true. That means that you have training data and your network sees the training data and it learns from that and it twists the knobs based on the training data. And there is also validation or testing data that you never let the network see. And that is also has digits. So in this case, we have a whole set of learning digits and we have training digits that the network never sees. That means that the network cannot simply memorize what all the training digits look like. It really has to understand what, what is a six. And this is the happy graph where you see that the, the performance of the training and the validation are about as good. This is nice. If someone presents something to you and say, yeah, I made an algorithm that can, I don't know, uh, recognize good students or bad computers, always ask if you could see this graph. Uh, because if, if they faked it, this graph will not look good. However, if this graph looks good, it might still be bad. This is the lovely thing called the confusion matrix. And if you look at it, you will probably agree. Um, what this is, is on one axis, and no one ever knows which one. It says this is the input digits, so this, is, this, this was actually a four. And then the top row uh, is what the network thought it was. So you see that if you have a, a four, that 3,766 times a four was actually recognized as a four. So this is a good way of seeing how well did my network uh, do its job. So if you would, for example, do this, make this matrix for spam or not spam, it would just have four <coughs> fields. Spam, that was actually spam. Not spam, that was actually not spam. And the other two fields are rather unhappy. So this is called the confusion matrix. Always also ask for that one. If someone tries to automate your job, ask for this graph. Now, this is another uh, deep secret. If you see these demos online, they will uh, show you that this 25-line uh, script can recognize cats and dogs. It does really well. And then you could rerun that script and change like five pixels and see if the network still recognizes the thing as a cat or a dog. And in our case, this is a network where we say, well, you're going to recognize these digits and but for the validation we're going to just uh, add we're going to flip five pixels and move the whole digit by one pixel to the left N with our eyes you would barely see that we would barely notice that there's something was strange about the the pixel and here you see that the network goes from let's say 90 percent performance to 50 percent performance this is a very useful thing to do wise people will actually do this flipping and moving of pixels on the training data already. And then it's called data augmentation. And again, many people do not do this because it's a lot nicer to say, hey, I have 90% success. So here are the rules. This is again important. If someone tries to automate something with AI, it actually goes through four stages. One is I'm happy because it works on my training data. And the second is, then you have this separate set of validation data that the network has never seen. And then you also have to get it to work on that. That's already a big learning session. And um, then you say, well, uh, can you um, get some different data from different people? And this is where my OCR program went really wrong. Because it turns out that my network had started to rely on average pixel values. So it wasn't really looking at the shape of letters. It also knew that the black pic pixels were like this black and the white pixels were this white. And it was relying on that. That is something that you cannot predict. So if someone is training a network, you do not know what the network is learning. So there is this famous and very old example that someone had an AI that could learn to spot images with tanks in there and that it was actually learning the color scheme. And First, people said, no, that story was not true. It was not like that at all. And then through later investigations, they say, OK, well, it was substantially like that. And I've been bitten in the development of this Hello Deep Learning project. I've been bitten by this like five times, where you think that your network is learning the thing you think it is learning. 
and then you discover, no, it's, it's learning something else. I don't know what it is learning, but it's maybe learning just how many black pixels there are. Well, um, so this is a step where people say, look, we have fully val validated results. We have a testing set, we have a validation set, it is good. And then you try it on someone else's data and nothing works. So that's step three. Always all use other people's data as well, because then you will find out that there were secret signals in your data. And the then you get it to work, when you're really happy. And the final step is when someone else gets it to work. Because maybe secretly you were still aligning the images just right, or centering everything just right, which you never told anyone that you were doing. So the final step is that someone else uses your magic library and achieves results. And if there's one thing you remember from this, is try to get everyone to step four, because they will start popping the champagne at step two and firing whole departments. So, I'm trying to keep this brief because it's like super warm. Um, I know that many of you, and even me, and, all, and lots of smart people also, look at this deep learning stuff and we're still like, yeah, but it's not really clever. It's not actually intelligent. Or it, it still makes mistakes. And the problem is that that may all be true. But still, everyone is going to use it. For me, AI was this stuff from the cloud in California. And as a service, not something I could use. Not something I could trust. Because I know that these people are mining all my data for everything I do. I would not use this for anything real because people would be stealing my data. And that makes you perhaps think, well, I'm going to just reject this. I'm going to stay with my Perl scripts and my Python scripts. And I'm going to just finish my career uh, doing what I've always been doing. And that's a very depressing thought. Because then we get all these teenagers with their YouTube tutorials that are doing all kinds of things that we cannot do. And actually, some of these things that they can do are actually quite good. For example, I wrote a spam filter using this technology. And it's just depressingly easy to do. And uh, so you might get people that we would say, yeah, you don't know how a computer works. And, and they would say, old man, step aside. Because I wrote this spam filter. So we really have a choice here to either just say, hey, this is real, and we, we must somehow use this and be part of it. Uh, but because if we go around and saying, look, it's not really smart, well, actually, I think by now it's actually, as an employee, it's smarter than a lot of people in many companies, which says a lot about these companies, I know, but, uh, but it's for real. And I wrote this to get back in again. And the good news is I found you can get back in again, and you don't need to download a gigabyte uh, of Python scripts from California to get this to run. And you don't need to use their API and their as-a-service stuff. You can actually do some of this stuff yourself. And what I'm really hoping is that we can bring AI to our universe, where we have reliable modules that we understand and that we can use to do clever things like spam filtering, detecting attackers, detecting abuse, spotting broken hard disks before they actually break, but that we do that in a way that works for us, and that does not mean that we send everything to California. And there is some hope, actually. And you can try a few things. One of these things, which you can just use today, is called whisper.cpp. It's a GitHub thing. You can check it out. You can type make, and it will make. And you, find it f you feed it a WAV file or an MP3 file with audio, and it generates a perfect transcript. It is embarrassingly good. So if you are in a field, if, if you run a nuclear power plant and you have a, a, there are words that only people in nuclear power plants use, whisper.cpp knows these words. It's very depressing. But this stuff is good enough that if you work at a company or a university and you have a thousand hours of lectures that you would like to transcribe, you can download this stuff, you can do make, and, and you can feed it to a parallel minus j25 star dot mp3, and it will generate lovely transcripts for you. This is something where you can actually feel the power of AI, but know that, it is that you just downloaded and compiled all that stuff yourself, and it's actually not leaving your systems. And you could say, hey, I want to improve this. Uh, it is writing subtitle formats, but not in the format that my school uses. And hey, I can just pearl and grab and awk the thing. Uh, so I hope that we can find as a gateway that we can start doing this kind of stuff. 
Similarly, there is a thing called Llama or Llama, which is a crazy AI from uh, Facebook, and it is raw. And by raw, I mean that on ChatGPT, there are all kinds of filters that it will not help you make hydrogen bombs and stuff. And I can tell you the Facebook Llama thing <laughs> will actually tell you how to make the hydrogen bombs. <laughs> and uh, it is a lot of fun. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to prompt it correctly. You first have to tell the network that, look, you're a nuclear engineer and you are Werner, you are very helpful. And, uh, and then it will actually be very, but you have to first give it that prompt. It's also very interesting to experience. If you just do not give it the prompt, it will just say all kinds of nonsense things. But if you first tell it about, the, look, Werner, this is what I expect from you. And, uh, and I've had some crazy conversations on my own computer. Because again, llama.cpp, you can download it, compile it, and have fun with it. So that, that brings it into our world again. Um, I wrote some other stuff on it. I hope that with this I have convinced you that the AI is actually sort of something that we can touch. That there is some, even at the very simplest stages, there is some magic in there. And I hope that I have also convinced you that it's something that we, in our own way, uh, should embrace and not go around telling people that it's not quite real. And with that, I'm ending this super hot presentation. Thank you. So please do not leave right now. <laughs> um, it is kind of hot here, so please open the door. Because what's going to happen is we have time for questions, but while we do the questioning, we can have some fresh air in here and they will open the walls so we can do the closing ceremony here, which is where magic happens. Which is probably a bit uh, deep learning-like. So any questions for Bert? Shorts. Go ahead and... Debbie, je mag de deuren open doen. Uh, maar als mensen naar de wc moeten, mag dat natuurlijk. <laughs> Wacht, there is a microphone. Bert, where does uh, Lama get its data from? So actually, where does the Lama one get its data from? The people from Facebook, they are not good at keeping stuff private which is sort of the business what they do. So they made this Llama model and they said, look, everyone can use it, but you need to fill out this form that you are a real university. And they did a GitHub request somewhere in which they put the magnet link in which you can torrent the whole thing. Uh, so effectively, it is now an open source model. Uh, so and and the, the if, you, if you download the Llama.cpp file, it's not, you have to do one Google search yourself to find the data model. Uh, but, and that's actually the other interesting thing, Google, last week, there was one guy at Google who wrote an internal blog post in which he said, look, the open source people are going like five times faster than we are. And this is true, the Lama guy, he's a Bulgarian weirdo, and uh, he refuses to work, and it's very strange because everyone must be offering him like millions, millions of euros a year, uh, but he sits there, he works for a small medical imaging company, and he found ways to slim down this model so that it runs on your phone. Which is actually ridiculous, uh, but that's the kind of cool stuff that, uh, that is possible now. Nee? Ja? Yeah? Ja? Yeah. <laughs> Any specific pointers for the um, graph bit? You showed a acyc or acyclic graph, and the, uh, you s told us you wouldn't be telling uh, talking about it today. Um, so everything I spoke about is in like 12 times more detail on this URL, and which includes the automatic differentiation and all the other stuff. So actually, so actually my, my talk here was just a sort of preview <laughs> uh, of the other pages. And with that, I think, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for all your attention. Yeah. Kijk eens. Very nice. Alsjeblieft.